Mr. Chidambaram. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's not often that you get a former finance minister to come and speak just a few days ahead of the union budget. But that's the advantage of once you're in the opposition, you're, you have more time on hand. Uh, I'm pretty certain that if Mr. Chidamram was in government and even had written a book, there's very little likelihood of him having been available in Kolkata. But he is also the finance minister who has the distinction of uh, having delivered the second most number of union budgets. That's eight full union budgets and two interim budgets. So I don't think there is anyone else who knows uh, uh, budget making better than him. And someone suggested the other day that could we have the same NDA government with Mr. Narendra Modi as prime minister, but Mr. Chidambaram as finance minister. I don't know whether he would like the idea. Would you like that idea that you could have a, you know, like they have in the West, that you just choose the best people for the best ministerships. The prime minister may change, but ministers should remain the same. Would you be comfortable with the idea of delivering a budget for Narendra Modi? Even in the unlikely event of having been appointed, I would have resigned on the 8th of November. <laughs> You really would have resigned on the 8th of November if the Prime Minister had uh, announced demonetization? Or is that simply opposition rhetoric? Absolutely. No major economy in the world has demonetized its currency over the last 50 years. The ones that come to mind are illustrious countries like Zimbabwe, North Korea, and Libya. Now, India has been added to that list. Number one. Number two, what Governor Venkatramanan for two years, Governor Rangarajan for five years, Governor Jalan for seven years, Governor Reddy for five years, Governor Subarao for five years did not do, Dr. Urjit Patel did in 64 days. So I think it was a terrible decision, ill conceived, terribly implemented with horrendous consequences. And I think this was foretold, would have been foretold by anyone who knows about money supply and monetary policy if the Prime Minister had chosen to consult him. Uh, you, we'll come to the consequences as you see it in a moment, but when you say Urjit Patel has done what other governors uh, have not and has done it in 64 days, are you saying that the Reserve Bank of India's autonomy and credibility is over? Are you saying that the Reserve Bank of India's governor was a pawn or a puppet in the hands of the Prime Minister? On this issue, yes. Because reversing the sequence stipulated in the Act, instead of the Reserve Bank recommending withdrawal of legal tender status for currency, here we have the government recommending to the Reserve Bank that legal tender status should be taken away. That was on the 7th of November, 2016. The Reserve Bank Board is called. Was there a written notice? They won't tell us. How many people attended? They won't tell us, but I have found out that only two of the three independent directors attended, the remaining posts of independent directors have been vacant for the last two and a half years. Was there an agenda paper for the meeting? They won't tell us. Were there minutes of the meeting? They won't tell us. How long did the meeting last? They won't tell us, but I have found the meeting lasted 30 minutes. And then the recommendation is made to the government, and the cabinet is waiting for the recommendation. I'd like to ask the crime thriller author who left the stage, how did the cabinet know that the RBI will recommend legal tender status being withdrawn? It was a command performance. And to that extent, on this incident, I think the Reserve Bank's reputation has been put at great risk, a point which Governor Reddy made. The, the, the flip side, of course, is that uh, we did a poll on, at in, uh, in, in India Today's latest magazine 
which shows that there is widespread support for the Prime Minister's demonetization move and which suggests that the biggest strength of the Prime Minister post demonetization is that he is now seen as a risk taker. He's seen, therefore, as a muscular leader, something which your government lacked. He took a risk. People appreciate leaders who take risks. Well, we didn't uh, take risks. We only delivered 7.5% average growth over 10 years and lifted 140 million people out of poverty. And I'd like to believe your poll. Let me assume your poll is right. I'm willing to concede that a very large proportion of the people still would like to believe that demonetization will work. But everyone within the next two, three, four months will come face to face with reality. Here are parents, there are children. Some of these children will want to go to medical college, engineering college. Demonetization has put an end to corruption. Demonetization has put an end to black money. That's what the polled respondents in your survey like to believe. I believe that too. Now when you go to medical college admission, they will ask you capitation fee. Will they take it by check? Will they take it by under Paytm? Will they take it by credit card? So you'll come face to face with reality in two, three months when engineering college and medical college admissions open. The farmer is already coming, coming face to face with reality. He wants a mutation of his land record. He wants his building application approved. He wants an income certificate. He wants a caste certificate. Has corruption come to an end? How did they seize eight crore worth of new notes? Not old notes. The old notes were the corrupt note. The new notes are incorruptible notes. How did they seize eight crore of new notes from the chief secretary's residence and office? But you know, you, this is the, some would say this is the cynical Congress attitude that nothing changes. Corruption is going to remain, so don't do anything. The flip side is, we know corruption exists, let's try to do something. Agreed. And that perhaps explains the Prime Minister's success, at least initially in his messaging. Look, here I am, I'm trying to do something. The Congress attitude seems to be, nothing's going to change in any way, so might as well not do anything. I agree with the Prime Minister that we must try to do things which will bring about change. But is demonetization going to bring about the change? For a month you talked about demonetization when it became clear that the last note among the 15 lakh 44,000 crore is coming back to the Reserve Bank, you are now talking about remonetization. Why do you demonetize and then remonetize? Accept it. But the question Koda is. Pahad Nikli Chuhya. <laughs> Not bad, your Hindi's also improved. You become an investigative journalist, you're finding out what's happening in Reserve Bank of India meetings, and your Hindi has improved. That's not bad at all. I, I guess some and benefits out of de uh, demonetization is you've been forced to learn a bit of Hindi. And talking about change. Prime Minister Modi is a big change agent. Congress party is a no changer. And that is why the Congress party brought about liberalization and a new economy in 1991. And you call us no changers. All these are children of liberalization. It, it's, about, it's about, Mr. Chidambaram, dare I say, about credibility. When former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh stands up in parliament, and says it's a monumental mismanagement, it's organized loot and plunder. When you today critique the Prime Minister, for every one finger that you will point at the government, they will point four fingers at you and say 2G, coal scam. They will turn around and say, who is the Congress to talk about corruption? So while your arguments may well be valid, the problem is, does the Congress have the credibility to carry that message? 1991, sir, is 26 years ago. So we may not have the credibility at a given point of time to carry the message, but that doesn't mean we will never acquire the credibility. Men will come and men will go. 
Political parties will remain, political systems will remain, change will happen. I think we are not discussing whether something that happened five years ago or ten years ago was right or wrong. If it was wrong, the people have punished us. What was right, the people have rewarded us. We are talking about demonetization today. So let's ask ourselves the questions that deserve to be asked. Is this the way to put an end to corruption? The answer is no. The first act of corruption after demonetization was detected in Kandla Port Trust in Gujarat, where 124 new 2,000 rupee notes were found in the possession of two engineers. So what, it, so, so what, what is the solution? Let, let's assume that, as we accept that there is a serious problem of corruption, let's assume that the cash ratio in our economy is perhaps seen as on the higher side, that we need to in some way reduce the cash component in our economy. Who said it's on the higher side? That's the government's argument. I'm giving Ge you the Germany, government's argument. Germany, 80% of all transactions are cash. Austria, 80% of all transactions are cash. Australia, 60%. Canada, 56%. And the mighty United States, 46%. But there is a large, there is a large parallel economy, a non-transparent economy. My question is, if you believe demonetization was the wrong way, to go about it, what would be the right way? What would you have done? You've been in power more than the BJP has been in power. What would you have done to ensure a more transparent, cleaner economy? Oh, Less there are corrupt? many ways. There are many ways, and they've been tried. And if you go back and read the Income Tax Act, there are provisions which were introduced in order to reduce cash transactions in large value monetary transactions. And that should have been expanded. For example, we introduced third-party reporting. It's third-party reporting that brings a lot of information to the Income Tax Department. We set up the FIU, the Financial Intelligence Unit, to which every bank has to report suspected transactions. We expanded the list where certain transactions cannot be in cash. So I think that should have been expanded. FIU should have been strengthened. Third party reporting should have been strengthened. Punishment should be deterrent. That's the way to go about catching that uh, chuhia, not uh, trying to move a mountain and heap misery upon millions and millions of people. Just look at the farmers. They have suffered thousands of crores of rupees in losses because of crash in prices. Daily workers, there are 45 crore people in this country. 45 crore, none of them is here. 45 crore people in this country who have a daily wage or a daily income. 15 crore depend upon a daily wage through manual labor. The remaining 30 crore are self-employed or employed but depend on a daily income. The flower seller, the fruit seller, the carpenter, the artisan, the electrician, the plumber, the head load worker, the mandi worker. For 30 days to 45 days and even beyond, many of them were without jobs, without incomes. You don't heap misery on 45 crore people and say the idea is to catch a rat. You know, it's interesting the way you put it, but I'm just wondering then what explains the fact that the Prime Minister's A, popularity seems intact and there seems to be at least among, dare I say, possibly through a class war, support for the Prime Minister from the very groups that you say are worst affected. And I'm just wondering whether it's that old Marathi saying, which I'll translate into Hindi for you, ki dusro ke dukh mein sukh milta hai. I see somebody else in trouble, I feel happy. So my bullock cart is in trouble, but when I see the guy with the Mercedes, also with a slight tire puncture, I get delighted. So somewhere what Mr. Modi has successfully done is created the impression of some kind of a class war. That what I am doing is teaching the rich of India a lesson and eventually I will benefit the poor. So for now his messaging has been about a class war. Is that where perhaps he is succeeding politically? May not be economically, but succeeding in political terms. Well, I don't know who will be the ultimate winner in this political battle. I agree with you that he is triggered or capitalized on resentment. Exactly what 
Donald Trump did in his elections recently. It is triggering resentment of one section against the other. The other reason, I think, is a deep-seated desire among everyone that we must put an end to corruption. We must put an end to black money. If the Prime Minister says this will work, fine, since it resonates with my deep-seated desire to put an end to corruption, to put an end to black money, let me go along with the Prime Minister. But sooner than later, everyone will come face to face with reality. They are already coming face to face with reality. All small and medium enterprises across the country are closed. 80% have closed down. To revive them, ask any businessman, there are many in this audience, to revive a business which is closed down will take months, if not a couple of years. You know, I, I'm just wondering whether the biggest chuha in the room or the one, the one group which will not get affected is the netas. You know, in all this, I don't see a concerted attempt to end political funding it being done in terms of cash. We've got a Uttar Pradesh elections. I'm told that candidates are actually paying three crores to get uh, a seat or, uh, uh, to, or to be made candidates. And many of them are paying the money in cash. I'm just wondering where the money of politicians come from and whether the politicians of this country will ever come together and say, look, we are going to demonetize the political class of this country. Will that ever happen? Will political funding, which perhaps is the root of black money ever end? I mean, it's easy for small, medium industries and you know to get hurt, uh, someone like me to get hurt. But what about people like you, sir, dare I say you as a representative of a political class? It is, I agree. It is because fighting an election has become an extremely costly affair. Even f getting a ticket has become a costly affair for many parties. Fighting an election has been an extremely costly affair. How much does it cost, if I may ask? <laughs> In it, your view? It costs much more than what the Election Commission legally allows. I, in fact, would blame the Election Commission partly for this. Election Commission has driven elections underground. My first election was 1984. The first three or four elections were elections that were a celebration of democracy. They were overground. We had flags, festoons, banners, music groups, bands. It cost us very little. It cost us very little in the first few elections because campaigning was overground. Last three elections, the campaign has been driven underground. For example, the AIA DMK doesn't hold public meetings at all, doesn't hold a public rally at all. They don't even hold street corner meetings. They win elections because they start the campaign at 6 p.m. in the evening. Tick off the list, take a red line through all the non-AIDMK party workers, DMK, Congress, local party, strike them out of the red line. Put a green tick on all the AIDMK, and then put a yellow or a blue mark on the undecided. And all that they do in the 21-day election campaign is to identify who has to be given money, and the money is distributed in carefully packaged envelope to every house, 5 into 500, 4 into 500, 2 into 500. That's the only election campaign that takes place because the election commission has driven elections underground in this country. Which is why I ask you, if the prime minister tomorrow was to turn around, let's say, on the 2nd of February and make a dramatic announcement on political funding, not easy because he has to go possibly through parliament to actually get it passed, but say that we are going to have state funding of elections. I'll support it totally. You'll support it. Will your totally. party support it? I don't know. I am, I'm not the party. I can only raise my voice on the party. I'll support it totally. Because I'll tell you why. I cannot contest an election anymore. <laughs> because I can't find the money. Come on, Mr. Chidamram. I can find legitimate money. The election commission will not allow it. I cannot find the legitimate money. I can find the legitimate money. I'll probably have to ask a few clients. 
But you, the election you just, commission you just won't have allow to raise your fee as a lawyer. The election commission won't allow it. I can't find the legitimate money. So you believe state funding is an idea whose time has come? Absolutely. Okay, good. That's a you know it's good to hear an opposite. I I wonder whether you would be as candid when you're in government. You know the problem is a lot of these things are said when you're in opposition. Once you're in government. You know, state funding should have happened years ago. The entire issue of elect you're blaming the election commission. No, I don't blame no the election commission. I, mean, I, I blame the political a, parties. Yeah, I don't believe a Maya or a Mamta. Discussed. Will a Mamta Banerjee accept state funding? She seems the most angry for some reason over demonetization. And I wonder why. I mean, why is it? Why is it that Jandhan Yojana accounts in Bengal per capita have been found to have the highest amount of money? That, to my mind, suggests that the Jandhan Yojanas have been used for money laundering. Do you, do you suspect that as well? That Jandhan Yojana See, accounts have been used for money entire, laundering? Entire data has not come in. Don't go by anecdotal evidence. The anecdotal evidence that I've seen says 25% of all Jandhan plus the earlier financial inclusion accounts, there were 24 crore of them, by the way. The government may have forgotten them, but you shouldn't forget them. 25% of all those accounts are still zero balance accounts. So there was no money laundering in those 25% of accounts. In the remaining accounts, what numbers I've seen shows that the average, average number, amount of money that has been laundered is 27,000 rupees. Yes, in a small number of cases, huge amounts have been passed through. And that may be a case of laundering. But don't say every Jandan account holder, some poor farmer somewhere, gave his money for laundering is not correct. Because the evidence doesn't point to wholesale use of Jandan accounts for laundering. But there seems to have been considerable amount of money laundering. Do you believe the Reserve Bank of India must come clean and tell the country how much money has actually come back? We still don't have a figure. They won't tell you. We, we know the number. What is the number? It's all come back has actually even more come back. There's a suspicion that actually more than 15.4 lakh crores have come back. And which would suggest that something was going wrong when the UPA was in power. You weren't no. telling us the exact numbers of 500 and 1000 rupee notes that were there in the economy. Because that number is not available to the government. It's available only to the Reserve Bank of India. It's only now that the present government is becoming its own Reserve Bank of India. But you, you believe that the Reserve Bank must tell the country. Of course it must. You see, you must also take into account money in circulation according to the Reserve Bank, but which is not in circulation. Money that has been lost in a fire accident, money that has been washed away in a flood, money that has been put away somewhere and somebody forgot it. Uh, money that is in Nepal, money that is in Bhutan, money that is with money changers, just as our money changers have dollar currency, Money changers in Singapore and Malaysia and Dubai have Indian currency. Money with NRIs. An NRI visits India, takes back uh, a few thousand rupees. That will not uh, uh, be counted in the system. It is money in circulation, but not in circulation. So I think you can't have an exact number, but we have an approximate number. 15 lakh 44,000 crore worth of 500 and 1,000 rupee notes. My source tells me all of that has come back to the Reserve Bank of India. Wow, you have sources who seem to be knowing much more than the Prime Minister, the Reserve Bank of India governor seems to be telling the country at the moment. No, I mean, the uh, one thing in the opposition you become is an investigative journalist. No, I think you just keep your eyes and ears open. Uh, you can't uh, hide everything for too long. For example, we know from the PIO's release who has released the decisions taken by the cabinet from the 1st of January of the year, there is no noting for a cabinet meeting on the 8th of November, which is what I said at the AICC meeting. There is no record of a cabinet meeting on the 8th of November. Now, that doesn't require investigation. That just requires keeping your eyes and ears open. I know you're saying keeping your eyes and ears open. I remember talking to you a few days after the demonetization decision, and you said the cash crunch will continue, you believed, for six to nine months. The sense is the cash crunch is actually easing. That's not correct. Is that's, that correct? That's, that's not correct. I'll don't, ask, don't ask Kolkata, Mumbai, Chennai, Mumbai, Bangalore. I'll give you a number. 
there are only 5,199 ATMs in all the northeastern states put together. 5,000, note that number, 5,199. Out of which 3,645 are in Assam. All the seven sisters put together have about 1,400 ATMs. Half of them have no money at all. I was in Tirumala. Every bank has a branch in Tirumala. Not one bank in one ATM has money. There's been no money. Even today, 40% of ATMs have not been stacked with currency. So don't um, argue that the cash crunch is eased. Cash crunch is eased for those who are in metropolitan cities and now for those who are in Uttar Pradesh. They have rushed a lot of cash to Uttar Pradesh. <laughs> But the cash crunch is not eased in Nagaland. It is not eased in, uh, uh, the, the, in, in, in Orissa. It is not eased in the remote Bihar. So I think we tend, to, we tend to be very dismissive of the poor and the forgotten people of this country. You seem to be also troubled, Mr. Chidambaram. I remember in that interview by, that, by the introduction of the 2,000 rupee note. For some reason, you felt that the 2,000 rupee note to you made no sense. It doesn't make sense even today. You say a 500 rupee note and a 1,000 rupee note were the causes of corruption and black money. If they are the causes of corruption and black money, how does a 2,000 rupee note make it less a cause of corruption and black money? Actually, it's easier for people to st stock notes because it'll require half the suitcase to su keep that. Yeah, but you know, having said that, former RBI Governor uh, Raghuram Rajan reportedly, reportedly wanted 5,000 and 10,000 yeah, rupee notes. For different reasons. For different reasons. For different reasons, and I think that idea was rightly shot down. He gave different reasons, but then the government and the RBI finally shot down the idea. Since, since we are talking of Mr. Rajan, do you believe that the manner in which he was removed, effectively removed, will go down as one of the most sorrier episodes in, uh, in, 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 in the country, that, that one of the finest economists in the world has to leave the country because people start questioning his nationalism. And why didn't more politicians come out and stand up for Mr. Rajan? Well, I felt very sad. I, said, I wrote about it. I spoke about it. I think... Uh, uh, it's an extraordinary stroke of fortune that we could persuade uh, Dr. Raghuram Rajan to come back to India, become chief economic advisor, and then become governor of the Reserve Bank. Uh, I think uh, he is, he's done a lot of work on banking. His major book, which he co-authored, is on the evolution of banking in the 21st century. And uh, he would have gladly served his five-year term. And if nudged, he might have even served a few more months to uh, terminate with the first term or the term of uh, the present government. I think it is a loss to the country that he has to leave. But in retrospect, it seems to me that since he was implacably opposed to demonetization, the buzzes that the Reserve Bank, before Rajan demitted office, formally put its views on a five-page note and gave it to the Prime Minister's office, opposing demonetization. In retrospect, I suspect that one of the reasons why his term was not extended was the government was in a hurry to demonetize. And that's why 64 days after the new governor assumes office, we have demonetization. It's very interesting. You seem to know what the buzz is. You seem to know what the sources are. But let me turn to... I have to not been proved wrong so far about any of the buzzes I've revealed. Okay. Let me, let me turn to the budget. Since we are in budget week, uh, 1997 was your dream budget where you brought down tax rates substantially. You created the basis in a sense along with 91. That's the other big date, 97. Many of us benefited from a more rational tax regime. Do you believe the time has now come to further lower personal income tax rates and certainly rationalize corporate tax? Is that, if you were finance minister, 
today, would that be your primary focus in this budget? Time to rationalize tax rates even further. Read my column tomorrow, but I'll give you a preview. I know this will not make me popular in this audience. Have you read, I've just downloaded it, Oxfam's Economics for 99%. There's a report by Oxfam, Economics for 99%. 57 people in this country control as much wealth as 50% of the population of this country. Let me repeat that. 57 individuals in this country control as much wealth as 50% of the population of India. Inequality has increased. Thanks to liberalization, obviously the early winners will be ones who have the access to a liberal economy, an open economy. Now, demonetization has made it worse for the economy. We have already taken a hit of at least 1%. It might be more. But everybody's agreed the hit will be 1%. The CSO says, as of October, we have taken a hit of half a percent. It's nobody's case that after November 8, there won't be another hit of half a percent. The correct tax to cut is indirect taxes. You must cut service tax. You must cut excise duty. Customs is, of course, only for export import trade. You must cu cut customs duty. Therefore, any tax cut will benefit millions of people. A direct tax cut will benefit only a very small number, no more than 25 lakhs or 50 lakhs of people. An indirect tax cut will benefit crores of people in this country and will stimulate the economy. So the correct tax to cut is indirect taxes. If I was finance minister today, if my resignation had been rejected and I'm reinstated as finance minister, <laughs> I would have cut indirect taxes. So you would keep corporate taxes where they are, you would keep direct taxes where they are? For the present. And you would not even change the tax slabs? For the present, no. Because the ta what we have to do now is to alleviate the suffering and the misery of the masses of this country. So if I was to ask you one, two, three, the three big things that you would do if you were advising Mr. Jaitley, what would that be? And then I'll open it up to the audience. Maybe they have suggestions for you, but one, well, two, I have three. A, I have a list of do's and uh, don'ts in the column that is appearing tomorrow. Okay. What's the one do and the one don't? The one do is stick to the path of fiscal consolidation, which means fiscal deficit must be below 3%. Current account deficit must be approximately 1.5%. And the CPI inflation must be below 5%. Fiscal stability is the most important key. The world is watching us. Are we going to deviate from the path of fiscal consolidation and fiscal prudence? But fiscal consolidation, fiscal prudence at the cost of kickstarting public and no, you private can. investment. You can. There is no investment, sir, at the moment. That's because of a variety of factors. Uh, two more important, two most important factors is demonetization. And the second one is the widespread excesses of the tax enforcement departments. There has never been a period in recent times where if you ask a businessman privately, he will tell you every tax enforcement department is now become a completely unaccountable organization, unaccountable within itself and unaccountable to the government. Excise, VAT, customs, income tax, enforcement directorate, everyone has become totally unaccountable, which is why industry says, businessmen say, and I had a long chat with, I have long chats with businessmen whenever I travel, and they say, why should we invest? So we are know, happy, we are happy as we are, uh, let's take a holiday in Bali. Let me ask you before I conclude. It almost seems, uh, Mr. Chidambaram, as if all the problems of this country began on May 17, 2014. No, they did not. And India was no, a garden of Eden. Not. Look at the banking no, crisis. No, it did not. Look at the at the same time, the at the same time, that Rajdeep, our banks gave. At the same time, no, it did not. At the same time, the India story did not begin on 26 May 2014. 
No, I, yesterday, I, yesterday the Prime Minister said in Punjab, 70 years, we have had 70 years of destruction. That includes then the six years of Atal Bihari Vajpayee, the two and a half years of Muraji Desai, 70 years of destruction. I could only recall what Donald Trump said with President Obama, Obama President Clinton, and President Carter sitting that the establishment has robbed you. The triumphs of the establishment were not your triumphs. The victory of the establishment is not your, not your victory. America begins today. I mean, to rubbish everything that went over the last 70 years. He forgets that Atal Bihari Vajpayee was a prime minister of his own party. Then take the name of Mr. Vajpayee when you take the name of Dr. Manmohan Singh also. Well, our present prime minister certainly doesn't remember Jawaharlal Nehru. In, I, I haven't heard him have a good word for Mr. Nehru in any of his speeches, which is my problem with him. But we will discuss Mr. Narendra Modi on another day at another time and who he likes and he, who he doesn't like. But let me open this to the audience because I'm sure there are people... He said 57 individuals control 50% of India's wealth. Worldwide, eight people control half the world's weight, uh, wealth, from Gates to Bloomberg. This is a very cozy industrialist politician club. Finally, where does a politician get his money? Where are the billions? Means the tax havens abroad, means trillions of money lying there. Nobody in the government uh, for the last 69 years has. Uh, done anything about this. Uh, means, Mr. Uh, Chidambaram, crony capitalism, it was perfected by the Congress. Mr. Modi says he's trying to get rid of those cozy relationships. Political parties must raise money to fight elections. Otherwise, you cannot have a vibrant democracy. Elections cost money. You have to convey your message. I have in my constituency 3,000 villages. Even to reach 3,000 villages will cost money. But there are alternative means of financing which have been tried, tried with reasonable success. The Tatas have a trust. The Bharti Mittal has a trust. Wipro, Premji has a trust. They pay money out of this trust. We amended the law. When I was finance minister, we amended the law allowing these electoral trusts. So we should make it easy for businessmen, businessmen like any other citizen, they are entitled to support their causes, causes which will advance business. It's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. We must encourage businessmen to set up and make donations from the electoral trust to political parties. Then they will not have to give it through black money. At the same time, these unrealistic, foolish limits which are put by the election commission. How do you fight an election uh, in parliament election today? Uh, I think the amount is 35 lakhs of rupees. It's laughable. How can you fight an election with 35 lakhs of rupees? And I turn it... Why can't you have a realistic estimate simply to reach... I have today... Uh, 12 or 13 lakh voters. How do you reach 12, 13 lakh voters with 35 lakhs of rupees at the rate of 3 rupees per voter? How do you reach the voter? Similarly, the messaging is required and therefore I think we must fix the levels of expenditure at the same time allow businesses to fund elections through electoral trusts. No, I don't think that's what it is. You see, this is a strange country, sir. If a farmer, a, a marginal farmer, defaults on one payment of his tractor, the bank will come, send its agent, and seize the tractor. 
a businessman can get away with lakhs of crores of NPAs in this country and they simply move from one account to the one year accounting year to the other. We have created a society where a farmer's tractor is seized but a businessman can simply write off his loans as NPS and knows the banker, knows the finance minister, knows the politician and gets away. That's what makes us angry, sir. What about that? The anger about the average Indian today is a... Uh, that's the reality, sir. Like, like every statement of an anchor like you, <laughs> partly true, partly untrue. <laughs> NPS happen. But every NPA is not a fraud. Most NPAs are because they are victims of an economic downturn. When the economy goes into a recession or there's an economic downturn, accounts will become non-performing accounts. Yes, sir, but as we are seeing, as we are seeing just now, when IDBI bankers are being arrested. There is, a, there is a nexus, sir. A that small nexus number. doesn't affect a small man in a this country. A small number of accounts become NPA because of siphoning, because of laundering money, because of uh, siphoning money away from the accounts. Nobody is disputing that. Which is why Raghu Rajan once said, if you paint all NPAs with the same brush, you will put an end to both entrepreneurship and lending. Just reflect over that statement. Okay. If you paint all NPAs with the same brush, you will put an end to entrepreneurship and lending. You have to distinguish between NPAs which are victims of circumstance. We have had worse NPA situation. The so Vijay, so Vijay, Vijay Malia, Vijay Malia becomes a, a victim. Listen, and right, I didn't say that. Farmer. That is your, your statement, not my statement. <laughs> Don't put your words into my mouth. We have had a worse NPA situation. We had a worse NPA situation in 2008. We had a worse NPA situation in, I think, 1998, in the Asian financial crisis. We got over that. How do you get over an NPA situation? By trusting bankers, by trusting bankers, experienced bankers, to deal with NPA as a banker should deal with. They did bring down NPAs considerably after the 1998 crisis. If you paint all NPAs, there are villains. Go after the villains. But if a medium businessman, small businessman defaults and his account becomes NPA, he will have to hold his hand until the economy takes an upturn. No, I take your point. Only the, it's the big businessmen who seem to get away in India, not the small and medium ones. But yes, the gentleman here, yes. Yes, sir. You have not answered the question about the foreign money which is in trillions and trillions, he said. This is also my question. I was and not and asked any question about no, foreign money. No, what's your question, sir? My question is that in uh, foreign countries, overseas countries, Trillions and trillions of uh, uh, money is lying as black money and nothing is being done. You mean uh, Indian in money by Indians and foreign yeah, bank yes. accounts? Another, Do you want an another NPA you already touched. Third thing is, what you have told just now, there are NPA and Sikh companies whose owners are much more multimedial and they are existing there, but they have made their company sick. And there are people who have done NPA, they are still much more uh, holding up assets, but nothing is being done in your uh, time also, as well as now also. So what is the solution of all these things, which is much more than what black money we are thinking in, notes, etc., which has not come out. Okay, but this is I think your question is multi-time multi multi more money. Go ahead. You see, nobody has an estimate of how much Indian wealth is stashed in foreign accounts. Nobody has a real account. It's all wild guesses and estimates. But let's assume, let's assume for the sake of argument that Indians have stashed wealth abroad. The first attempt to bring that back was done in the UPA government. The Liechtenstein list was obtained in the UPA government. The French-German list was obtained in the UPA government. The first notices to those people were issued in the UPA government. The first cases were registered in the UPA government and the first prosecutions were launched in the UPA government. It is the same list that this government is working on. To the best of my knowledge, apart from the Liechtenstein list and the France-Germany list, the present government has not stumbled upon any other list. By a stroke of luck, they had the Panama Papers exposed by a group of investigators. And the Panama Papers has given them another list of names. I would encourage them to pursue those names. But I think 
the first effort to reach names of persons who may have stashed money abroad was done under the UPA government. Yes, the gentleman there. Yes, yeah. in the orange my, shirt. Yes, oh yeah. go ahead. My question, uh, Mr. Chidambaram, is uh, you know, amongst the many narratives the government has given on demonetization, um, I don't agree with most of them regarding terrorism and money laundering and counterfeit money. But the question regarding increasing the tax base and money which was kept in lockers and which is not in the banking system, they've come back to the banking system. And as far as the increasing the tax base, for example, someone who has a store across the street probably never filed his returns. Now he's bound to do that. So what are your views on that? I'd wait to see what is the exact increase in the number of tax returns that have been filed. We'll know that when the last date comes sometime in July or August. If more people have been brought into the tax net, I welcome it. VDIS of 1997 was intended for that purpose. It was a huge jump in the number of people who started filing returns thereafter. So if as a result of demonetization and the IDS, if some more people filed returns, I'll welcome it. But on the locker issue, a bundle of 1,000 rupee notes from the locker may have gone to the bank. Just wait for the day when all withdrawal restrictions are lifted. A bundle of 2,000 rupee notes will go back from the bank to the locker. Okay, now, two quick last questions. The gentleman there and the boy here. First, the boy here. Why people save is not something which, uh, uh, I mean, anyone can fathom. It's, a, it's, a, it, it's multiple reasons why people save. Um, therefore, why people keep their money in lockers is not something that on which you can make a value judgment. Uh, therefore, when the restrictions are removed, a large proportion of these deposits will come back as cash in households. People will keep it in their homes. People will keep it in their lockers. Yes, the young boy there. Yes, quickly. Uh, sir, is the shift from a blacklist economy to a cashless economy a poor attempt at damage control? And the second question, uh, you talk about winning the masses. So do you think that the Congress needs to change its face to win the masses? Very good question. Let's answer the, answer the second question first. I'm not competent to... I'm not competent to answer the question. It is the AICC and the Congress Parliamentary Party which has to decide upon the Your leader. personal view? For the time, at, the, at present, at present, the, if you call an AICC meeting today and if you ask either for an open poll or a secret poll, I have no doubt in my mind that over 90% of the AICC members who are the elected delegates will vote for Mrs. Sonia Gandhi as the Congress president. And if she is not available, will vote for Mr. Rahul Gandhi as the Congress president. Now, whether that is good, bad, to your liking or not to your liking is a separate issue. You ask me a straight question. If the Congress party is asked to vote, how will it vote? And I've given you a straight answer. I think we are going to have to end. We have run completely out of time. Just 10 seconds, sir, quickly. Good afternoon. In one of your budgets, uh, you had introduced a banking transaction tax. Well, they're going to do it again, I'm told. Yeah. Thereafter. Do you feel vindicated today? Quick well, answer. Yes and no. Yes and no. I'm vindicated because the BCTT was vigorously, vehemently opposed by the BJP. So in that sense, I'm vindicated. No, because BCTT is past its sell-by date now. BCTT was relevant in 2005, 6, and 7. BCTT is no longer relevant because we have an FIU and we have a suspicious transaction reporting system where every transaction in the bank is being reported, something which you may not know. Every transaction in the banking, to the banking system, above a certain threshold is being reported today. So BCTT, the sell-by date is over. So I'm yes and no is the answer to your question. Your final question, sir. We've run out of time. Uh, see, the, uh, the bigger the lie, uh, the bigger the number of people believing it, so said a famous propagandist. Uh, so in the context of demonetization, I hope I'm allowed to ask a question to Rajdeep. Sir. Because this is the question on mass communication. So tell us what the opposition party has got wrong in terms of exposing this lie. All, all questions are to be directed to Mr. Chidambaram. Uh, but, if I, but if I were to use one word, it's credibility. At the moment, whether you like it or not, 
for some reason, Narendra Modi seems to carry more credibility than the opposition. That may change. And uh, who knows, in a post-truth society, as they call it now, you're right, the more you utter a lie, the more it's likely to carry currency. But we will leave, as I said, a debate on Mr. Modi and his politics for another day. Yes. My, my, my real quarrel with demonetization, I mean, I don't use harsh words in writing or speaking, and I don't want to call it a lie in the sense that you called it. My real grievance about demonetization is a decision of this magnitude, this momentous decision, which has enormous consequences. And I want you to think about it. We are citizens of a republic. We celebrated the Republic Day only three days ago. A decision of this kind cannot be taken, ought not to be taken by one person. Who are the three most important officials in the finance ministry who should be involved in demonetization and on the front foot coming and defending demonetization? Who are the three officials? Number one, the finance secretary. I challenge any one of you to name the finance secretary. You would no, finance Shakti secretary. Kanda He's Kanda not Kanda the finance, not finance secretary. secretary. I challenge any one of you to name the finance secretary. Wrong again. You can't name the finance secretary because for 70 days, the finance secretary has not uttered a word on the subject. The second most important person is the banking secretary. And I challenge you to name the banking secretary. For 70 days, the banking secretary has not uttered a word. And the third name, you know the name, the chief economic advisor, for 70 days he has not spoken on demonetization. What does that mean? It means that the three most important officials of the finance ministry concerned with banking were neither consulted. If they were consulted, they disagreed. If they disagreed, they are too timid to put in their papers. Thank you. Let's end it there. I think, Mr. Chidamram, you've given us enough food for thought this morning. Thank you very much. Please give a big hand to the former finance minister. Just hold on, sir. There's a book launch for Mr. Kanoria. Just before you leave, Mr. Chidambaram and Rajdeep, may I invite up on stage from Shri, our principal partner, Shri Hemant Kanoria, Shri Sunil Kanoria, and Dr. Hari Prasad Kanoria to launch a very special book commemorating 25 years of the Shrey journey. Turning dreams to reality, Shrey's infrastructure journey is now out in the open. Mr. Chidambaram, would you like to say just a few words on Shrey and the book? Mr. Chidambaram, Mr. Sardesai, Jeet and Mala Banerjee, ladies and gentlemen, it is truly a privilege for us to launch our first book, Turning Dreams into Reality. We are a company we started 27 years back from Calcutta and in the infrastructure space as a financial institution with a very small amount of money. And Mr. Chitambram was just mentioning that 91 was the era when the liberalization was uh, launched in India. So we are also a child of that liberalization. We started off in the infrastructure space, which was basically only the domain of the public sector. It was the first time that a private sector initiative was taken in the infrastructure space financing infrastructure, which was only for the big boys, which was for the government only. So therefore, it has been a very challenging and uh, thrilling experience for us. Every moment for us has been breathtaking. Because we were starting from Calcutta, so therefore there were a lot of challenges. And people felt that we would never succeed. But here we are, from a small company, starting with about 5 lakhs of rupees in 89. Today we are managing a portfolio of 40,000 crore. So therefore, 
what we have learned in the last so many a couple of decades in the last 27 years specifically is that partnering with entrepreneurs india is one a land of entrepreneurs everywhere there are so many thousands of entrepreneurs who are there so when we started off we partnered with all the construction companies contractors and we have 60000 of them who are partners who have grown and many of them are much larger than us we also took an initiative about 8 years back of partnering with small village level entrepreneurs and today we have 55000 of them as our partners in the villages and they support through initiatives in the villages almost about 55 crore people so therefore i think that we wanted to share this experience with all of you and with the people of india we wanted to share this experience of what we have been able to do in this great country with people overseas that india can set examples on ppp model for infrastructure we want to set this example to others that they can share from our experience the failures that we have had the successes that we have had the challenges that we have faced and the opportunities that we have been able to and cash and capitalize from time to time so that is what is our sharing of this experience what we were inspired and motivated when my father sunil and me we were writing this book was from the amar chit katha that you know usually if you write something which is long and lengthy drawn out people don't have the time to read it and they can't absorb as they say that a picture can capture hundreds of words so therefore this is a graphic representation of the journey not of shrey but of a company which started from calcutta a company in the private sector which started with infrastructure so therefore this is our experience we will definitely and we will be very curious for you all to read this book and give us your feedback because it is always a learning experience for us we have learned from the environment we have learned from the government we have learned from small enterprises we have learned from entrepreneurs in the village how to do business so thank you very much and please do read this book and give us your feedback thank you thank you so much mr kanoria i think uh, copies of this book are available at our bookstore as always